Flynn? Me. <laughs> Since being back in the States and having so many options, I've been drinking everything under the sun. Sweet tea, pink lemonade, raspberry lemonade, peach tea, peach green tea, hella sonic beverages, and maybe a dab of water here or there. I'm disappointed because it's hot as hell in Texas and I need to be thinking hydration, but luckily, I was sent more liquid IV, and surprisingly so far my favorite flavor is the lemon and lime. I know, seems kind of basic, but I just love it. It pairs well with the saltiness of liquid IV, because if you didn't know, it's a hydration multiplier that has three times the electrolytes of a sports drink and hydrates you faster than water on its own. And in my opinion, tastes better than a sports drink. Um, they have so many flavors. I also love the passion fruit, and they have the acai berry. Um, and they keep releasing new flavors like I can't keep up <laughs> But they also come in these convenient single serving packets. So perfect for on the go So if you've been a silly beverage sipping bum like me I've been slacking on your hydration I can get you some liquid IV honey using my link down below the code is said by Jess will save you 25% Yes, go now get you some Okay first a lot of people were asking if we got a new dog. We did not. Hold on. <laughs> These are my brother and sister-in-law's dogs. This is Ollie. And this is Mia with Hoomst. Nigel loves to cause chaos with. But right now, it's a bit civilized. Hey, hi, hello, welcome, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess. And I'm looking a mess, but it took a lot of energy to pull myself out of bed to film this video for you so you're welcome so welcome to another episode of book community but remixed to book legal tea uh, trying to keep you abreast of this ongoing trial so this is a summary of week two of the case between the department of justice the united states versus burlesman or penguin random house to block the merger of penguin random house acquiring the other publisher Simon and Schuster. I do have three companions here, so if you see me looking, giving side eye, or scolding, it's doggies. So I did plan to put these all up in one week and then said no. Also filming, Nigel, come back into my view. Thank you. Also filming situations, I'm not in my own house, so there's that. But I took my notes and we're gonna run through it and see what these rich people have to say shake her heads and then this will probably be out on friday which i think is the 26th and my goal is to have the third week which is the final week out next week uh tuesday or wednesday right i know you wanted them closer together so you could like get the thingy get the get the gist but at the end of week three i just do hit some high bullet points and wrap it all up for you so if you do forget some stuff, it can, re you know, revive, what? Revive your memory? Refre refresh your memory. Words. All right. Also, I'm getting all of this information to God bless the people working at Publishers Weekly that they were attending the trial and they had people live tweeting it and then they had someone like write up a summary. Move. If y'all don't, why y'all gotta be right under the tripod? Nigel, move back. Okay, then they had people write up nice summaries to summarize it all. I think there were like four or five. Oh, me. Okay, y'all need to sit down. Anyway, I'll have it linked. And it's like a page and then it has week one and it has multiple, week two, multiple, right? So I'm not giving you everything. I'm just highlighting some pieces. So if you want all of that, you can go uh, to, to their to their website, I'll link it down below. I forgot how to speak. All right, so week two, this starts out with a quote and we have the CEO of Macmillan. Why don't these dogs want me to be great? Why can't I live? Just a quick thing, if you don't know, there are currently five big publishers in the United States. Penguin Random House is the biggest. Then we have HarperCollins, Macmillan, uh, Hachette, and Salmon and & Schuster. And that does not necessarily go in their size, except that Penguin Random House is the biggest one. And towards the end of 2020, Penguin Random House made a bid to purchase Simon & Schuster for like $2.2 billion. 
Um, it has to go through a lot of steps. But then finally, last year, the Department of Justice of the United States sued to block the merger and now they finally went to court starting August 1st. I summarized the first week. You should go back and watch that one. So quickly, I saw this on Twitter and I was like, wait, I have to add this. So book publishers just spent three weeks in court arguing they have no idea what they're doing. And literally, um, I have quotes that are coming up that are from the first week. So I'm going to do those before I get into week two. Jonathan Carb is the CEO of Simon & Schuster, and he said, The self-publishing is more of a threat than I thought. In reference to Brandon Sanderson's $50 million Kickstarter, something that literally no other self-published author is capable of achieving. Yay! And defending the idea that publishers don't guarantee a marketing budget said, It's like taking credit for the weather. You can't promise success to the author. But wait, there's more. Marco Stoll, who's the CEO of Penguin Random House, literally said they are called Random House because everything is random in publishing. I literally cannot deal with these dudes. Now for the second week, so we're starting out with the CEO of Macmillan. His name is Don Weisberg, and so he's on the stand. He gives us this wonderful quote, less competition is going to change the dynamic. Two of the major players becoming one, the prices, the advances, the type of competition at the auctions, I think it'll have an have impact across the board. If I'm an agent and there's one player that's bigger than everyone else, I think that will have an impact. You'll have to change your behavior to deal with that. So Weisberg referred to Penguin Random House as their largest competitor, um, but and he dismissed what the defense was trying to say. So they've been trying the defense, which is Penguin Random House's side, has been throughout the trial trying to say that Amazon is a legitimate competitor in the publishing industry, and people who've been testifying for like the government are like, no, they're not. Like they distribute a lot of books. They're indie. Um, sales are really great but they're not publishing like they themselves don't Mia back up sorry but they themselves are not like publishing books like a legitimate publish publisher and so he also um, said that like they're not a threat to the big major publishers big five um, he did say in 2019 it seemed like maybe they were gonna try to enter that game but they haven't um, and then he also brought up the example of Brandon Sanderson which I thought was really interesting he referenced his Kickstarter which obviously was like the number one funded Kickstarter ever it was super wild that he did for his four uh, books the secret projects and he was saying he noted that Brandon Sanderson was already a massive best-selling author who still publishes books with multiple big five publishers so something like that <laughs> and I'm glad that came up because I feel like they would try to use that as like look I feel like they would try to bring that up and like look all you gotta do is do kickstarter they'll be fine so I'm glad that someone said that but don't get excited right every time a rich white man gets on a stand and I have a little hope at the beginning I don't know why because they they quickly dash that hope but again parts of his testimony conflicted with his deposition so they were impeaching parts of his testimony I'm like I don't know how long ago they gave the testimony or their deposition I didn't look at that but it's like are they asking you trick questions and you're tripping up or like why are you changing your answers i'm very confused i'm not a lawyer i'm not a legal anybody so if that's a common thing and you know that let me know but it just is odd to me that so many people who've been testifying in this case have had different things between their deposition and their testimony so part of it was to go on he categorizes Penguin Random House as dominant which I do believe they are the biggest publisher I don't have the number of like the market share that they have and the defense was like well Macmillan ain't small homie <laughs> he was talking about their imprints and like successful books and authors that they have in their imprints like they have Flatiron Books they have Oprah who has her own imprint and then they also have um, an imprint Farrer Strauss and Giro apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong but it's FSG because the FS attorney the defense attorney also asked how many Nobel prizes have authors from FSG won would it surprise you if I said it was 25 and it's like okay that's great that sounds really nice I still don't I don't understand how that's relevant here but okay we're learning things <laughs> like I don't I don't understand these people so Judge Pan then asked um this is later it's uh we have Brian Tart, who's the president of Viking and she was asking about acquiring books with big advances compared to buying books at a lower level and he said or she asked is it fair to say there isn't competition for books like that specifically in five-figure advances so 
in the first video I talk about how the government's case is really focused on authors and potential authors who are getting advances of $250,000 or more. Their little category of like top sellers or you know the ones that they think are going to be top sellers and so now she's asking about like there's doesn't seem to be as much competition for books that aren't going to get in advance that six figures so tart said there's some competition when buying books for mid five figures but noted in many cases publishers look to grow their own authors um and toward the end of his testimony then we're going back to weisberg he clarified his conclusion this killed me so at the end of weisberg testimony he said his conclusion that the merger would have an impact on publishers came from his gut and not his experience with prior mergers and I'm like well my gut says it's wrong too but oh, I just feel like they're gonna be like oh, see he doesn't even think critically what is he a woman thinking with his gut <laughs> and so thanks Don then we're moving on to an excerpt, expert witness for the Department of Justice and his name is Nicholas Hill. And I was like, what is he an expert in? So I looked and it said he's an expert in antitrust issues. So he served as an economic expert uh, for the Department of Justice for the Federal, Federal Trade Commission before for private clients. And if you would like to know, he's a PhD in economics from Johns Hopkins University. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> obviously he's an expert witness for the government. So he defended their category that they created of anticipated top selling authors the ones that are going to get the advances over two hundred fifty thousand dollars being a random house is like you made up that category but they're like it's been used before so it's not like super made up and that's just what they created for their focus for this case um and he also explained that if the merger went through it would give them such a high market share that was mentioned in the last video um and that top selling author market would theoretically depress advances so he's saying his opinion they're gonna have such a big share of the market that their authors wouldn't get as big advances which i don't know how that works i don't know how to do math but it's like i don't know but that's what he said and then there are more numbers so if penguin random house acquires simon and schuster they will have 49 percent of the market just two publishers and that's just two of the big five because there's other smaller publishers independent like 49 percent those two merging into one would control he also responded to the defense's insistence that self-publishing uh, represented a major competitor like they're really trying to say that if you take all of the other publishers who are not big five publishers you basically make them a big six and they can <clears throat> they can compete then on this particular day, another government witness came in, Brian Murray, who's the CEO of HarperCollins. And apparently HarperCollins is the second biggest publisher after Penguin Random House at this moment. And of course, they also bid on Simon & Schuster back in 2020. Um, but I guess when Penguin Random House was like, we'll pay 2.2 billion, they were like, Ugh. sister. We cannot, we cannot come up with that coin because they said if they had paid that price, they didn't feel like they could find a way to get a return. Um, and so they had to bow out, but he would, Nigel. But like I said in the first video with the other rich white dude who was the CEO of whatever he was the CEO of, I think it was Hachette. He was the CEO of Hachette who said, now I don't think Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster merging is a good thing, but it's not because I care about us going down from big five big publishers to four big publishers. It's more so that Penguin Random House is so big and them adding in another publisher, then they're just gonna have a ridiculous cut of the market. But if someone smaller like us, Hachette took them, then it's fine. And so essentially this guy from Harper said the same thing. Like I'm not necessarily against it going down to four. I just don't want Penguin Random House to be able to buy SNS. And I, I hate it here because he was like, I mean, if it doesn't go through, we would love to try to bid for Simon & Schuster again. Like, if you're the second biggest, I don't know the difference. I think this said, uh, I think I might have it in my notes. Okay, so currently I think Penguin Random House is at 37% of the market, HarperCollins is at 22, and Simon & Schuster is at 12. So Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster would combine to make it 49% of the market, but if Harper Collins bought Simon & Schuster, they would be, hold on, I can't do math, 34% of the market, right? Oh my God, 
Who farted? Y'all are so nasty. Nigel, come over here. Oh my God. 34, I think, which is not as big a share as Penguin Random House, but still, I still think five major publishers is too few. So back off. Uh, he also expressed concern that if the merger goes through, that he worries about the ability of HarperCollins to compete with Penguin Random House, obviously because they'll be so big, they'll have so much money. Um, I talked about in the first video how they, in week one, they were talking about the importance of backlist. And since these big five publishers over years have just acquired other imp all these other publishers and now their imprints under them that they're bringing with them so many authors and so many backlist and backlist titles still generate revenue which gives them a big cushion and that cushion gives them more room to take chances um where else small smaller publishers can't do that so now he's concerned if they have to be compete against this massive penguin random house that it's going to be really hard when like books goes to auctions or whatever um so but then they were he said them merging would be about three to three and a half times bigger than harper collins which i'm not good at math but well that's not three and a half i don't think you know and so the defense was like hold up we looked at your fiscal year for 2021 and then that it said the differential would only be two times which is what my slow brain is saying and um he said the ceo of HarperCollins was like, he didn't include that because he doesn't, because HarperCollins doesn't often compete with other big five publishers on series romance or Christian titles. He did say that Amazon is a contender, a threat on the romance front, which would make sense because indie, pub, indie romance authors, a lot of them, I would dare say the majority, publish through Kindle Unlimited. Um, so I can understand that being a contender, but it's just like, I don't know. The math ain't math and what you did, sir. I need you to come with the facts because not you lying and then got the defense tripping you up. <sighs> oh my goodness. I really feel like I don't have great energy in this video and I'm so sorry. I just want to get this information out to you. So I apologized. Um, and so he uh, he also was impeached um, because his testimony was different than his deposition. Why? So then Nicholas Hill, the expert witness, is back um, and the article said he delivered a zinger. And I was like, ooh, okay. <clears throat> Agents feature in many different markets, Your Honor, and they don't have a magic wand. While they know their advantages in selling their books to publishers and they know how to leverage them, if there's significant reduction in competition, they can't fix that. And I was like, wow, zing, zing, zing. I mean, I didn't think it was really a zinger, but apparently the person did, so we're going with it. Um, <clears throat> then we have this dude that I kept write, writing in my notes. His name is Randy Oppenheimer, but I just put Randy Man. <laughs> so he be, he's for the defense. He began his cross cross examination, and his goal was to undermine Hill, the expert, because Hill also had a lot of models and stuff, all this economic stuff. I do not understand. If you're really into that, you can go read the full thing. I'm sure you will be enthralled. Um, but this person said they felt like he ex seemed to succeed to some extent, although Judge Pan had to remind Oppenheimer that uh, Hill is an expert on economics and not on book business. Um, and some of you don't have everything. Some things are like sealed or they weren't like public for the court. Uh, but then I put my notes, discussions about models and things I don't understand. You have to read that yourself. But Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer or Randy Mann asked about the market share of all other publishers outside the big five which again here it comes which he argued in combination amount to the size of a sixth publisher or they amount to the size of Simon & Schuster with a successful track record of acquiring books above the $250,000 point and their foot therefore should be considered a big six so he's saying every other publisher outside of the big five basically consider them as one and they are about the size of Simon & Schuster, so they should be a big six. And it's like, mm, but they're not all one though. And that's what Hill said. He said they're not one firm. And if you were to merge them into one firm, the concentration in the market would go up. Again, I don't know exactly what that means, but you know, I read it. 
Um, and then we're now they're having more agents testify. So we have a literary agent, Christy Fletcher, who owns and operates Fletcher and Company Agency, stressed that the current auction structures really depend on variables at play. And she was asked if the merger would make it hard to acquire rights. And she responded that it would mean it would be harder to hold back rights, a common practice of agents. But her primary uh, concern is the bidding process. She said there are positive effects if um, Penguin Random House got like it, the merger went through because Simon & Schuster uh, would benefit from their marketing knowledge and a bit ability of a combined entity to support the retail environment, specifically independent bookstores. And I guess, but like, Penguin Random House is already so big, why can't they support independent bookstores now? Like, I don't, I don't, they didn't really elaborate on that point and I really want to understand what they mean by them combined would really support the retail environment instead of like are they gonna put out more books combined i don't know i didn't say nigel sit down please um <clears throat> she also said an author might accept a preemptive bid rather than have a manuscript go to auction if they like the deal and that her clients are creative people who care less about the dollar amounts of advances and more about professional objectives and achievement although money is a factor no doubt have another agent who went through to explain just kind of uh, the roles of agents that they're honor bound to act in the best interest of their clients. Nigel, come here. So those interests include finding the perfect match between author and editor in the industry. Um, they said the industry is all about relationships since agents don't focus on publishers, only on editors imprints. The proposed merger will not affect her process. I found that the multiple literary agents they had seemed indifferent to it. They seemed either to think it would be a positive or that mm, it's not really gonna bother me or affect how I operate, which I think is interesting. Um, there was another one, her name was Walsh, I don't know her first name. She said, we hope every book we work on will be a, a bestseller. Um, and then if SNS or if Simon & Schuster were to disappear, there would still be people wanting to edit and publish great books, I'm sure. Uh, but also Jennifer Bergstrom of Gallery Books was asked about focus titles, like books that you think are gonna do better and the ones that get super high advances like if they uh give more like marketing and like put more effort into those and she said well it just seems to me a matter of economics at this point don't you favor the ones you expect to sell well which they talked about last week and saying that i think it was penguin random house who was like well we don't like just because we give a high advance doesn't mean we put more marketing money into those books than other books and i want to call bullshit on that um but then actually, you know, maybe not. It depends. I don't know. We also had Josh Glusman, or Glusman, who's VP and Editor-in-Chief at W.W. W. Norton Co., which is the nation's largest independent employee-owned publisher. And um, well, he was asked why a long history like Norton's is important. He said, we are not beholden to any corporate interest. Very important, which enables them to keep an author like Michael Lewis because he's an extremely close relationship with the editor and others at Norton. And but then he said, but then he said he thinks the merger would increase, not decrease um, advances. So I think that is interesting. But then he also said um, that big five pub publishers regularly overpay for books and that at WW Norton, that they are directly impacted by that because they lose authors because they are not willing to overpay for books. So they pay for say we pay on the basis of what we think our pro projected sales are and then he says that mid-list authors are going to be the ones most negatively affected by the merger and so again the i find it weird that the government chose to focus on such a small percentage of publishing even though i can't remember the number that i had in last video that i think it was like the top four percent of books published like the super successful ones finance like 60% of the publishing market I believe um you would have to go back to that video to see so I guess I understand that but also I just think it's weird that there haven't been that many mentions to midlist authors besides this and then the five figure advance portion because yeah it is going to be them who are most negatively affected I mean we already had a CEO last week say oh you know a hundred thousand dollars is a small advance so <sighs> it's like oh geez but then they had some dude come on who is the author of some book called the power of habit and he was saying you that he didn't go into writing for you know a big advance he did it to sell millions of copies of books because you make so much money 
um, beyond advances and he thinks if the merger goes through penguin random house wants to make the world a better place for writers the thing i know about andy ward who i think is an editor at penguin random house hey hey hey, hey. and penguin random house is that they love authors and want to give us the freedom to write what we want to write okay it's a nice delusion that you live in uh those were the main points of week two um, and then I have week three coming later, but I think so far we can see that these people are clearly out of touch with people in the middle, Millis authors. Um, I don't know what this, I really, I like obviously I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know this judge. Hey, hey, so I don't know what the ruling is gonna be. Um, it's said that Judge Pan is set to make a decision in the coming months, so I don't know how long that'll be, but I don't know. I don't feel super confident on either side. My pessimistic side wants to say that she is going to rule in favor of Bertelsman um, in Penguin Random House, and then also I'm like, I don't know. Maybe they will lose, but then if they aren't able to acquire Simon & Schuster, those other publishers are just gonna come in and try to buy it and say, will there be another lawsuit? I don't know. I, ooh, that bitch is tired. It's, it's a lot. Anyway, I'm so sorry about the lack of energy, but we are struggling. Um, so I hope you got something out of this, learned something. If, especially if you are a legal professional in that field at all and understand some of those things I mentioned better than me, uh, feel free to put that down there. But yeah, so we've got two weeks of the trial. There's one week left that I have to cover. What do you think? Who's going to prevail? I don't know. I look forward to seeing your comments and discussion down below. Always keep it cute, be respectful. But thank you for watching. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you would like to. Always check out my description. I'll link to uh, the Publishers Weekly articles. Always have where you used to find me on the internet, where you support my channel. If you'd like to, like join my Patreon. Um, but stay blessed, hydrated moisturize and sunscreen. <laughs> I started to forget it. And I'll see you in my next one. Bye.